can put away your notebooks because there won't be a quiz on this one. It'll be a written quiz on all the rest of it, of course. Um, but I thought we would uh, try to focus tonight on a couple of uh, uh, passages in the Scripture and some background around those that are widely misunderstood um, that ha- happen to be a natural point of departure f- for our Daniel study, but uh, our focus tonight isn't Daniel. Our focus tonight will be uh, the events that surround our traditional celebration of Christmas. So why don't we start tonight by opening to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And we'll just uh, refresh our memory on the first 12 verses. I'm sure they're familiar to you, and yet uh, uh, let's uh, plunge in. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and art come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule thy people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. How many of you have heard that story before? About a third. That's pretty good. <laughs> no. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. It's interesting that uh, we have that King James uh, has them as wise men. The actual term is the magi. The magi. And I thought we'd talk a little bit tonight about some misunderstandings about what this, what's really going on here. And uh, there are, it's amazing how this particular story has become the subject of so many interesting traditions in the church. The first notable uh, dimension to this uh, is that these men were Gentiles. And that's rather striking to find that in the Gospel of Matthew. Because if you understand Matthew's organization and his preoccupation, of course, he's talking about the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And yet here we have these magi coming. The Eastern traditions in the Eastern church, you see the Western, most of us visualize three kings. Have you heard three kings? didn't say kings, did it? And yet they see the, the, the idea of kings came in about the third century as a, assuming it was fulfilling Psalm 72. You might want to pop over, hold your place, we'll come back to Matthew, but Psalm 72 Verses 10 and 11. The kings of Tarshish and of the isle shall bring presents. And the kings of Sheba and uh, Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all the kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And uh, so the church figured, gee, these wise men may have been kings. We'll find out who they really were in a minute. The Western tradition is that there were three of them because there are three specific gifts mentioned. It doesn't doesn't indicate that's the only gifts that were given or how much of each was given, but because of the three gifts, they traditionally are three, uh, three wise men. The Western tradition is that they arrived on the 6th of January, the 12th day of Christmas, Epiphany in some church calendars. The Eastern tradition, interestingly enough, is that there were 12 of these guys. They arrived on Christmas, but the Christmas for them was January 6th. So the January 6th is where this sort of picks up. I had a lot of fun. I was once a uh, chairman of the board. Uh, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank had me take a company out of Chapter 11 in Silicon Valley. And one of our goals 
for the for a classified intelligence agency was to finish a l very unusual project on a very very tight deadline. I won't bore you with all those details, but the big the, the critical path was getting some very complex software done. And I can remember reporting to my venture capital backers that uh, well, I was so proud of our guys because they worked right through December 25th, right on through, solidly, 24 hours a day to finish the software. What I didn't explain to my venture capital backers is they happened to be Eastern Orthodox. Their Christmas was January 6th, not December 25th. <laughs> no, I actually did explain it to them, but I got the, got the effect of the meeting first. Anyway. So there are di different traditions. In the third century, these uh, three wise men or three magi become kings. There's a sixth century chronicle that even gives us their three names. Uh, Bithesaria, which later becomes Belth uh, Belthasar, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Belthasar, and uh, Melchior, which becomes Melchior, and Gathaspa, which becomes Gasper. Now, there, in the 7th century, there's a tradition that they, these three wise men were uh, represented Asia, Africa, and Europe by being delegates from the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All these things are very colorful ideas and patterns. Um, there's a 14th century tradition that Balthazar was the king of Arabia, Melchior was the king of Persia, and Gaspar was the king of India. There were relics discovered in the 4th century that was attributed to these three guys. They were transferred to Constantinople and Milan, in the, uh, from Constantinople to Milan in the 5th century, to Cologne by Frederick Barbarossa in 1162, where they are still there to this day. You can see these relics that are attributed to these guys. Now, as you can probably tell from my style, it, uh, it's never, you know, you can't have Chuck Mr. Bible study with something about some controversial, so we'll, we'll, we'll find out what's really behind the Magi, if we can here. It, the Magi term is a Latinized uh, from a form of Magoi, which is Herodotus speaks of this. It's an ancient Greek transliteration of the Persian original. The single, singular is Magus. And you'll notice in the book of Acts, chapter 8, we have uh, Simon Magus, who was a, uh, in Samaria, who was a magician, sorcerer type guy. And uh, in, in Acts uh, uh, later, I forget what chapter, uh, Elamus Magus at Paphos Island on, on the island of Cyprus. Twice in the book of Acts we have magicians show up in a derogatory way as vile, immoral fellows. The term magician comes from the term magi. So the word magi has its roots in the occult. And yet, uh, its er, its origin is is uh, extre I think extremely provocative. There is a term in Jeremiah 39 called Rab Mag, which is the chief of the Magi, and that is an untranslated title of one of Nebuchadnezzar's court. Magi of lesser rank are mentioned in Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter four, and Daniel chapter five. We spoke of them there in the King James as magicians. You'll notice, if you read really carefully, that the magicians are in contrast to the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are also a title of magician. The Magi were Medes rather than the Chaldeans. Even Nebuchadnezzar's empire was a combination of the Medes and the Chaldeans, and of course the Medo-Persian empire was a coalition of the Medes and the Persians. What, you, what, catch, what should catch your uh, 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 eye is that Rab Mag was a title of Daniel, in chapter 4, verse 9, and chapter 5, verse 11. The fact that he was a Jewish appointee to be not only a Magi, but in charge of them all, is very unusual because the Magi were a hereditary priesthood in Persia. Um, the fact that we had a Jew, Daniel, appointed as head of the Magi is far more profound than just the fact that he was in charge of that particular group. A staff group, uh, the repercussions of this is probably what led to the plots against him in Daniel chapter 6, the whole lion's den thing. So let's, that, that catches our eye. We want to know a little bit more about Magi. The Persians, um, the Persian Magi, ha were credited throughout the ancient literature a very profound and extraordinary um, religious knowledge. Babylonian magi through the centuries were considered generally impostors. The Persian magi were very, a very venerated group in general. There's some exceptions. Darius the Great established the magi, the state religion of the magi, as the state religion of Persia. 
And by the way, this precedes Zoroaster. Many of the texts that you see in encyclopedias say that the Magi had the roots in Zoroasterism. No, that came a little later, actually. And um, now the Magi's skill, this is interesting, is considered to be expert not in astrology, as many people like to see because of the star here. Don't get confused by that. The history shows that the Magi's skill had, their root, had its roots in the interpretation of dreams. Doesn't that look interesting? You're beginning to see, see how the, the, the fog is lifting. So Daniel is at the root of this, interestingly enough, it, for the Median court. So it's a nyromancy or a dream interpretation, not astrology. That's one of the, the, the key skills. And this is mentioned by Herodotus, who wrote in about the 5th century B.C. Now, it was this dual capacity of the Magi, both religious and governmental guidance, that invested them with enormous authority and they became the supreme priestly caste in the Persian Empire. There is a trilingual inscription of Bitsatun where Darius I, Darius the Great, has in three languages describing the Magi in uh, Elamite, Akkadian, and Old Persian. And it speaks of some of the politics at the time. But it's interesting we have uh, discovered uh, archaeological evidence for this. And the fact that they're not originally Zoroastrian is interesting because I mentioned that not that it's that important, but it allows you to qualify. As you run into texts and things, you can tell it's superficial if they, if, if they don't go further than that. Now, it's interesting that this ancient religion of the Magi had a surprise as they study this. I'm speaking from secular sources now is it had a lot in common with Judaism, or, or I, should, I shouldn't say Judaism, but the, the, the religion of the Jews. Each was monotheistic in concept of a, benef, uh, a beneficent creator, author of all good, who in turn was opposed by a malevolent evil spirit. This is not dualism that came later. Each had a hereditary priesthood. The Jews did too, through the Levites. Uh, and they had an essential mediator between God and man by virtue of a blood sacrifice. Each depend on the wisdom of the priesthood for divination. Now, in, in the Le Levitical priesthood, of course, they had the Urim and the Thummim. And the, in, in the, the Magi used what they call barsims, which are bundles of divining sticks kind of thing. B both of them had the same con pretty much the same concepts of clean and unclean animals and so forth. So it's interesting as even the secular records as you go back uh, 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 highlight this. And, of course, the Magi developed into a hereditary priesthood serving several religions, and they're the priesthood cast during the Seleucid, Parthian, and Sasanian periods. But now, what we're interested in is the New Testament period. This is The first point is to recognize that there was apparently a cult, a subcult, a sect within the Magi that, was, that apparently preserved prophecies we don't have given to them by Daniel. And that gives rise to the occasion in, Daniel, in Matthew chapter 2. Now... It fascinated me as I did some research on this to begin to under... You get a whole different picture of Matthew 2 if you do a little bit of homework on the political background at the time. So bear with me a little bit. Since the days of Daniel, the, the um, fortunes of both the Persian Empire and the Jewish nation were very intertwined for, for in subsequent history. Both nations had fallen into the Seleucid Empire after Alexandria, uh, Alexander the Great... He conquered the Persians. When he broke down, uh, his generals divided up, and the Seleuc in the days of the Seleuc Seleucid empires, uh, both were subjugated, Persians and Israel. But subsequently, both achieved their independence. The Jews under the Maccabean leadership, and the Persians uh, uh, under the... Uh, 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 they, had a, uh, they had a dominating group uh, within the Parthian empire, which followed. It was at this time that the Magi because their dual priestly and governmental office composed the upper house of the Council of Magistanes, which is the upper council house of the Parthian Empire. By the way, I can't prove this, but I believe that's the where we get the term magistrate. You give you a feeling of, of, the, of the secular authority that's uh, embodied these people. Their duties included the absolute choice and election of the king of their realm in the Parthian Empire by the Magi. So it was because of this that when a group of Persian Parthian kingmakers arrive in Jerusalem in the latter days of Herod, Herod is in panic because there's a dimension to this that we missed just uh, uh, by not having the background. And so you need a little background about the Roman Parthian rivalry in those days. Now Pompey was the first Roman that conquered Jerusalem in 63 B.C. 
He attacked the Armenian outpost of Parthia, and then in, in 55 B.C., Crassus led the Roman, the Roman legions into sacking Jerusalem and subsequently attacked Parthia proper. The Romans were decisively defeated. About 30,000 troops plus the leader were killed. The Parthians counterattacked with a token invasion of Armenia, Syria, and Palestine. Nominal Roman rule was reestablished under Antipater, the father of Herod, who in, who, uh, who in his turn repeated, uh, retreated before another Parthian invasion in 40 B.C. So the point is, even when Herod's father was nominally in charge, there was retreats because of the wars between the Romans and the Parthians, back and forth across Palestine. Mark Anthony reestablished Roman sovereignty in 37 B.C., and like Crassus before him, he also embarked on an invasion of Parthia. It was ill-fated, and he got, he got a disastrous retreat. Then another wave of Par invading Parthians swept all Roman opposition completely out of Palestine, including Herod himself, who had to vacate. He fled to Alexandria and then to Rome. I want you to understand the insecurity, okay? It's interesting when you visit Israel and you see Masada. It's one of seven major fortresses that Herod built. He was fearful. These people are very insecure of the various marauders and attackers. Now, with a Parthian collaboration, the Jewish sovereignty was restored in Jerusalem was fortified by a Jewish uh, garrison. Herod, by this time, had secured from Augustus Caesar the title King of the Jews, but he did it by conniving and bribery. It was not for three years after he had the title, which including a five-month siege by Roman troops, that the king was able to even go to Jerusalem. So while it was Roman, it was, see, there's war go, wars going on. So even though he's king of, he had the title given by the Romans as king of the Jews, it was three years before he could perfect it in a sense. So he gained the title of a rebellious buffer state, Israel, or Judea, between the Romans and the Parthians. At any time, his own subjects, the Jews, bear in mind, Herod was not Jewish, he was an Edomite. At any time, he, the Jews could be conspiring with the Parthians to overthrow the Roman rule. It's interesting to understand the slippery rock, if you will, that Herod's on during this time. At the time of birth of Christ, Herod may have been close to his final illness. Augustus Caesar was also very aged. And Rome, since the retirement of Tiberius, did not have a military commander in charge anymore. See, the earlier Caesars were ex-military men and they, were, uh, they had a different orientation. Now, Armenia was pro-Parthian in these days. It was fomenting a revolt against Rome itself, which two years later it perfected. So the time was ripe for another Parthian invasion in Judea, except that Parthia itself had some internal dissensions, which is the only reason it probably didn't happen. Now, it's interesting that the king of Parthia at the time, Phretas IV, was an unpopular and aging king. He once had been deposed, and it was not improbable that the Persian magi were already involved in the political maneuvering as a prerequisite to picking his successor in Parthia. So get that background. Now it's possible that the Magi might have taken advantage of the, of, of the king's lack of popularity to further their own interests with the establishment of a whole new dynasty which would have, could have been implemented if, if they could find a sufficiently strong contender. Now it's interesting at this time it's entirely possible that the writings of one of their own men, namely Daniel, uh, who was one of their magis back, obviously, uh, several you know, centuries before, uh, may have been a motivating influence. The possibility of a divinely imposed world dominion at the hands of a Jewish monarch would be more than acceptable to these kingmakers. You see, the, the, what you don't, may not realize that you've studied, the, the Persian and Medo-Persian history is studded with nobles and uh, ministers and even some kings that were of Jewish blood. So you need to understand that the, because of the, the intertwining of the Persian and, and uh, Israel histories for, for the previous five centuries, that uh, a Jewish leader was not beyond acceptability in the, among those that might be involving themselves in that politics. So now it's in this background, I want you to visualize Herod, ailing, insecure, which at best is a, he's a pawn of Roman politics. We now have an entourage arrive, and don't get the idea, I'm always amused by these little, you know, major scenes, you got three camels with three wise men. Nonsense. There was a bunch, 
Some traditions, as I say, have 12, but more importantly, they traveled with a caravan and were protected by adequate cavalry because they were making an intrusion from Parthia into Roman territory, which they might do, but not unprotected. So what you've got here is a major arrival. That's why you'll notice you picked it up in here in verse 3. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. <laughs> and all Jerusalem with him. The whole town was aware of this entourage that has arrived. Cavalry escort, the whole routine. Now you can imagine the alarm now. You see, it would seem that these magi were attempting to perpetrate a border incident which could bring swift reprisal from the Parthian armies as, de as just a minimum. Now, they request of Herod, the, Her the request they make of Herod is a particular insult, if you understand the background. Herod got on the throne by connivery and bribery. And they say to him, where is he that is born king of the Jews? <laughs> Say, no wonder he's got a little, you know, Malox. Please, quick. Calculate, a calculated insult. Now, it's interesting, and of course, you all, uh, uh, first of all, they arrive. It's interesting that, you know, some people say, well, they arrive there by astrology. I don't happen to believe that. We'll come back to that issue. But if, if that's the case, it's very inadequate because it brought them to Jerusalem, not Bethlehem. You see, they were led to Jerusalem. They approached Herod first. Where is he to be born? And Herod called his staff guys and says, Okay, where is the Christ to be born? And what do they give him? Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You can read it. You can read Matthew's praise of it here. But let's pop over to Micah 5, 2 and see how it reads in, 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 uh, in, your, uh, in your edition of the Tanakh or the Old Testament that's in your lap. Page 947 for those of you that... Now, let me remind you, I become an instant Bible scholar. You get a tab at your table of contents. You flip there quickly and find out what page Micah is on. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Now, I might explain Ephrathah is analogous to what you and I would consider a county. There were two Bethlehems. One was up north in Ephraim. We're talking about the Bethlehem that's in Judea, in Ephrathah. In the Matthew quote, it clarifies that for you, Bethlehem of Judea, as opposed to another Bethlehem. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. That's an interesting phrase. We're going to come back to that one too tonight. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Strange verse. We always look at it as a reference to where Jesus was born. But the reference makes no sense unless you really understand the first three verses of the Gospel of John. Because Jesus Christ pre-existed His incarnation. We've glibly said intellectually, staggering in terms of its implications. That the Creator of the universe Himself would become flesh and dwell amongst us as a dependent babe in a manger in Bethlehem. Staggering idea. So anyway, back to Matthew 2. Uh, he gets the quote in verse 6, then verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired them diligently at what time the star appeared. Now, they've been traveling for quite a while. The star appeared when? We don't know. We do know that subsequently Herod decided to kill all male Jewish children under the age of two years. Now, you could figure that either the star had been around for two years, or maybe it was one year and he just made a margin for error. Who knows? But the point is this idea that, you know, you always see the little Christmas pageants where the shepherds come in, and as soon as they're out of the way, then the wise men arrive, and not quite. I mean, first of all, even by church tradition, there's 12 days difference. But anyway, we'll come back to that. And, and verse 8, when he sent them, then he sent to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Yeah. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the child, young child was. Now, the star thing is a whole nother bit. Um, 
There is a prophecy by Balaam in Numbers 24, verse 17. Balaam is a strange character, too. That's one of the most mysterious guys in the Bible. Um, but in any case, uh, he mentions that, uh, well, you can, so he's at least familiar with it. Uh, let's, some people try to link Numbers 24... with uh, the, 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 the Bethlehem experience. Verse 17, of number, in, in, in Numbers 24, Balaam is hired to advise Israel's enemies, in fact, to curse Israel. And, of course, he doesn't. He blesses it. And, and uh, that, that, that does not impress the guy that's paying the bills. But uh, in verse 17, he goes on, he says, And I shall see him, but not now, and I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. goes on. It's a, it's a prophecy that some people, the star out of Jacob, they try to make that the Christmas star. There's no basis for that. It's an interesting idea, but uh, I'm not sure where it leads, by the way. Um, it's interesting, there's another verse also in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, that some scholars use. However, what's interesting, Matthew in his gospel almost always seems to use every excuse he can to tie whatever's happening to an Old Testament fulfillment. In fact, some of them are pretty bizarre that he reaches for. And the fact that Matthew quotes neither of these is, uh, is, uh, uh, is interesting. Simon Bar Kokhba, the famous Kokhba revolt. Uh, Bar, Simon Bar Kokhba in uh, 132 A.D. This is after the destruction of, Jerus of, the, of Jerusalem. Uh, he, he took the name Simon Bar Kokhba, which is son of the star, which is a link, presumably, to the, the, uh, the, some of the undertones of the Balaam prophecy. Another thing you hear a lot about is that the uh, star was a result of astrology or astrological signs or astro astronomical signs. No less an astronomer than Kepler himself, the guy that developed Kepler's laws, uh, expressed the view that uh, he felt that the, the uh, Christmas star was a result of a conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation Pisces, which occurred in a very unique way in 7 B.C. There's some problems with that because 7 B.C. doesn't fit anything else. And it's even more complicated because many people misunderstand a quote in Josephus about an eclipse. And I'll come to that a little later, but uh, uh, not that it means anything, but just to, just so you understand, as a guy that is an astronomer, myself, uh, some knowledge here, I happen to hold the view that astronomy has nothing to do with this. Because, uh, first of all, uh, even the, ast the astronomers and astrologers, if you want to call them that, in those days uh, understood that these things hap went by patterns. They had various superstitions about them. But as a sign, it's an obscure way of looking at it. I'll come to some other examples of that in a minute. I personally hold the view from the text that this was something supernatural, not natural, and and uh, that uh, that's but, but it was something that was predicted, and I believe that uh, it comes. Uh, I believe that Daniel, uh, we do we do not have any reason to believe that all his visions were recorded in the Book of Daniel. In fact, even the ones he records, he, he emphasizes the sum of the matter, that is a summary, and the possibility that Daniel was entrusted with some insights that he in turn entrusted in a in a cabal in a in a, in a uh, a group of his uh, trusted disciples to carry forward for, well, what turns out to be 500 years to the time when certain things would occur and they were to, they, they recognize the significance of it. The fact that they bring these gifts I don't think are accidental. The gold, myrrh, and frankincense. There are three basic offices, king, prophet, and priest that um, Jesus fulfilled. The gold speaking of his deity. Frankincense was the uh, substance that was very predominant in the priesthood speaks of the priesthood and of course myrrh in the sense that he uh, speaks of of course of his death but it's interesting in the book of Isaiah we find that in the millennium they will bring gifts to Jesus Christ when he's ruling but they only bring gold and frankincense no myrrh because his death is behind him interesting isn't it you see, this is one of those reasons that I believe we're dealing here with 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years that are, it's an integrated message system. Every number, every detail, even the letters and parts of letters are there by supernatural engineering. And you find things like that and you discover that they're part of a pattern doesn't surprise us at all because it's written by a singular authority from outside the time domain itself. 
But uh, um, just to finish up the Magi for a minute, um, it's interesting that after the Magi go home, within two years, their king uh, 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 is killed by his son. His son is installed, duly installed by the Magi as the new ruler of Parthia. So they apparently were on a king-making exploration, or at least uh, not, 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 that wasn't necessarily the reason they came there, but the point is that was the atmosphere at the time. It's interesting that Philo of Alexandria, Cicero and Philo, uh, uh, all record that the Magi were attached to senior Roman courts with acknowledged gifts and understanding for centuries. So whatever these guys were, and of course, I don't misunderstand me, as the years go by, they get corrupt and they intrigue and rebellions and get put down, but the point is the, the sect of Magi uh, as a hereditary priesthood um, which had a beginning prior to Daniel, but Daniel gets appointed above them, on top of them, and, and uh, he's the, only, he, uh, the rest of them are all Medes. It's a Median priesthood. But Daniel, of course, was not a Mede. So. Now, it's interesting, too, those that like to make astrology the big answer uh, on this, you know, this is some of these are astrologers, is nonsense because they have to go to Revelation to find out, namely Micah 5, 2. I think we made that point, didn't we? Now, if you get involved in these discussions about stars and, uh, and so forth, one of the other things I'd like to just review and remind you of is that there's a very provocative, I believe, not free of, not, I believe valid, although it's not free of controversy, with respect to the constellations of the Matsuras. The sun has an apparent path through the sky, through the year. I'm not talking about the daily. I'm talking about the... The, uh, uh, on, a, on an annualized basis, the sun appears to move on a path through the sky. That path is known as the ecliptic. It's at an angle from the celestial equator, but the apparent path of the sun through the sky is called the ecliptic. If you take a band nine degrees on either side of that, you have an area that you and I would call the zodiac. And uh, it's interesting that these constellations, uh, there are 12 groups of stars, there are lots of groups of stars, but there's 12 particular ones that are on this ecliptic. Obviously, on a, in an in a annualized basis, you take the year and divide it by t in, in the 12 sectors, you, you end up with 12 groups of stars. And these constellations, we know by their Babylonian names. What's interesting, it may surprise you to know, that the Persian and Arabian traditions are, they ascribe the inventions of astronomy to Adam, Seth and Enoch, which I think is kind of, you know, I mean, it really goes back. The names we know them by are corruptions that occurred in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. Now, there's another dimension to this. To, to, the, the Bible mentions that God calls the stars by name. It also says he made them for signs. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Now the question is, what is the glory of God? And many people presume that's the creation. The great glory of God, and you can check the scripture out yourself, is his redemption. The redemption is vastly higher on his scale of things than the creation. And you can prove that two ways. One is, how important is something? One way to measure it is how much of the Bible is devoted to it. How much of the Bible is devoted to the creation? A couple of chapters in Genesis, a couple of chapters in Job, a couple of chapters in Isaiah, a few Psalms. That's about it. How much of the Bible is committed, devoted, focuses on the redemption? The whole book of Genesis, the whole book of Exodus. What about the book of Leviticus? In its own way, it's all, it's all it deals with. Numbers, Deuteronomy. And on it goes. We get to the New Testament, the Gospels, the Epistles. The book of Revelation is the climax of what? The redemption. Not just of you and I. Much more going on. Behold, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. A lot going on here. There's another way to determine how important these things are. What's the price tag? God created the universe with the breath of his nostrils, called it into existence. Could he do it again anytime he wanted to? 
What did the redemption cost him? The death of his son. It's taken the creation 2,000 years to recover from that so far. Interesting. Now, what I'm leading up to, of course, is that there are lots of misunderstandings about the signs in the heavens. We call this parent path of the sun uh, and the thing uh, the zodiac. It may interest you to know that it comes from a Hebrew root from sodai, meaning the way. Does that echo the book of Acts? It should, for some reasons I'll come to. The next problem you have, if you've ever gone to a planetarium show, and you see the, you know, the night sky simulated with, and they, they'll throw on the diagrams of all these constellations. And that is bizarre. You know, you see a cluster of things that look like a, maybe a figure eight at best, and that's Virgo, the Virgin. And she's carrying a branch in one hand and a, 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 sorry, a grain of wheat in the left hand. Really? You know? You see a bent W. And they, that's the lady, that's Cassiopeia, the lady chained in the chair. They have all these fanciful sketches for the small... And you have the most bizarre explanations from astronomers, men who are men of letters. Well, the stars, that's what they, the ancients imagined. Could they imagine it with that, such consistency that the, the legends and the names are the same in all cultures? That's interesting. Why? Because all cultures have their origin. Babylon. That's where they come from. Well, where do they get these weird... The pictures that they visualize are reminders of a story or a legend. The key to the legend is the name of the stars in the order of brightness. So you learn the names of the stars in the order of brightness in the original languages, and you, and you get what the original story really was. That's lost. It's amazing. I've, 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 over 40 years gotten involved with astronomers and observatories and temperatures, and I haven't found any of them that know this. And yet it's obvious if you do a little reading. Now, so the key to understanding what these are all about is to learn the names of the stars and the names of the constellations in Hebrew. In Hebrew. Now, it turns out that the one we'll just pick one tonight because it's Christmas. We'll pick what? Virgo, that, as we know it, right? Virgo in all the cultures, in all its variations, always emphasizes her virginity. She is Astria, Athena, Parthenos of the Greeks, Adara in the Arabic, and Bethula in the Hebrew or Syriac. The brightest star in Virgo is Spica. If you're a navigator, you all know how to find Spica. It's one of the brightest stars in the heavens. Good reference point. The word Spica means... Uh, uh, by the way, Virgo is always... And I forgot to bring my slides, but it saves you a lot of stuff anyway. Virgo is always shown as a woman with a branch in one hand and a grain of wheat in the other, even in the ancient Egyptian records. And no one knows why. In the Hebrew, by the way, Spica is the, um, well, let's see, the Hebrew name for the star Spica in the Hebrew is Tzemek, which means branch. But what's even more interesting are there are 20 different Hebrew words for branch. Semic is used exclusively as a term for the Messiah. Interesting. The Arabic is al semak or the branch. The Egyptian is Aspolia, the seed. Now, the association of the virgin with both the branch and the ear of corn, or ear of, actually, it's a, I should say ear of corn, it's a, it's a kernel of wheat, actually. It's confusing because in the scripture it speaks, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die. You can't bring forth fruit. Remember that in John? Well, what do you mean a corn of wheat? A lot of people say that's obviously the scripture's wrong because you can't, it's either wheat or corn. No, the term corn there is used in the sense of a kernel, a kernel of wheat. But anyway, setting that aside. I get letters on that. Can you imagine? Um, <laughs> now, it's interesting, this whole idea, of course, uh, uh, our Redeemer was born of a virgin, known as the branch of David, bringing forth fruit as a result of his death. So it's all there. Now, we could spend a lot of time. There are 12 of these signs. But by the way, each of the signs of the zodiac have associated with it three deacons or three other constellations, so they're a group. Now, that's kind of interesting. Virgo, the virgin, is associated with Coma, which means the Coma, Centaurus, and Butis. Those are Babylonian names. What is the proper name in the Hebrew? The desired one, the despised one, the coming one, born of a virgin. 
blows you away when you realize in the heavens, probably in the days of Adam, God revealed to Adam his overall plan of redemption. From the virgin birth of Virgo to the victory of the lion of the tribe of Judah, which we call Leo. And in those 12, if you take the trouble to go through those, you can find God's whole... By the way, all 12 of the constellations are associated with one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Virgo is associated with the tribe of Zebulun. What's that got to do with anything? Zebulun is where there's a town by the name of Nazareth located. Interesting. And on it goes. I love this because uh, every once in a while I have somebody come up to me and say, Chuck, what sign are you? Uh, I, ju I just love it when they do that. You know, I used to always go, well, you're astrology. You're gonna, no, no, I don't put them on that trip. You don't get anywhere with that. I say, uh, I'm a Leo. I was born in May. And they look at me because I'm some kind of dumb clod. If you're in May, you must be maybe a Gemini. No, no, I'm a Leo. I'm under the line of the tribe of Judah. And they, they don't understand. So then I get to explain it to them. They brought it up. I didn't. And I go through the whole routine. You know, it's great. A couple other questions. We're in sort of a Christmas mood tonight. Why was Christ born in Bethlehem? Well, because Micah said so. Yes, but why was it Bethlehem? There's a reason. There's only one thing that links Jesus Christ to the town of Bethlehem. And that's the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Book of Ruth, if you haven't studied it, you need to do that. It's a little four-chapter book that's the key to understanding the book of Revelation, chapter 5. It's an interesting little book. You have Boaz, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, who through his act of redemption restores the land to Naomi, a type of Israel, and takes a Gentile bride. And out of that whole thing, he is the link that ties the tribe of Judah and the royal line to the house of David and the place Bethlehem. In fact, I personally believe that the shepherds that received the Annunciation on what we might consider Christmas Eve were in the fields that belonged to Ruth and Boaz back in the days of the judges. Interesting tie together. It fascinates me that the book of Ruth in the, in, among the Jews is associated with the Feast of Pentecost which, of course, is that feast that points to the church. So of all the Old Testament books, the, the, the book of Ruth is not only prophetic of the church, but is also associated, interesting enough, with the feast that predicts the birth of the church. So those are, this is all by way of review for those of you that have been with us a few weeks. Um, interesting situation. We all, this time of year, have our thoughts turned to that manger in Bethlehem. And when you think about that, as you approach in your mind's eye that cave that was served as a shelter, be careful where you step. It was a stable, wasn't it? And as you look over and you see this child being laid in the straw in a saliva-strained wooden feeding trough, It's hard to imagine the creator of the universe himself putting himself in that situation, becoming a man, that he might dwell among us, that he might fulfill a destiny that would make us eligible for that which we could not attain any other way. Now, as we contemplate this, it's easy to think in terms of just the humanity that Mary and Joseph were blessed with by having this child and forget one of the key promises that was given to him. You might turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Let's pick up another verse that is so prominent on our Christmas cards. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Let's move from the comfortable to the little uncomfortable. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 are frequently quoted, but let's look at it carefully. 
Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Those are not the same thing. One is human, one is divine. A child is born, his humanity. A son is given. To understand that, read the first three verses of John, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Whoops. When did that happen? Hasn't yet. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Many people say, gee, He's ruling today. Well, we've got some things to talk about. <laughs> but wait a minute, it says, He shall rule upon what? The throne of David. And upon His kingdom to order it, to establish it, to justice and uh, with righteousness, from henceforth and forever. It's interesting, you say, well, that's an Old Testament prophecy, and what do we really mean by the, the, you know, the, the throne of David? Here again, Daniel's friend, a guy by the name of Gabriel, comes to our rescue. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We'll pick up the, the narrative about verse 30. Gabriel is the same guy that gave Daniel the, the uh, 70 week vision of Daniel 9, is here giving. Mary, a messianic message. Gabriel's always on a messianic mission. Michael's always on a war uh, as a captain of the, the Lord's host. He's a military commander. Gabriel is the messenger. Always messianic. Anyway, here. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Yeshua, or Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Interesting, interesting turn of phrase that Gabriel uses. It doesn't say the throne of David, because that would give all our would-be scholars an excuse to call that anything they like. Gabriel gives us a little, or I should say the Holy Spirit tunes us a little bit so we don't miss it. The throne of whom? His father David. Now we've got a problem here because the throne of David did not exist at that time. Jeconiah, back in the times of the Babylonian captivity, was the last of David's line to sit on the throne. Remember there was a blood curse on his line. Jeremiah 22. No man of his seed shall prosper, God says to Jeconiah. Boy, does that put God in a box. Because Jeco the, the, the Messiah had to come from the royal line, and yet now there's a blood curse on the line of Jeconiah. How's God going to get out of that one? Very simply. Follow Je in in uh, Matthew, he gives you the genealogy. As Matthew, being a Jew, takes it from Abraham. Abraham down through David. From David, he goes through the royal line through Solomon and down through Jeconiah. And ends up, of course, with Joseph, the legal father. Luke is a physician. He couldn't care less, so to speak, about the Jewishness of it. He was interested in his humanity. He takes his genealogy from Adam, gets to Abraham. Of course, from Abraham to David, they're identical. But at David, Luke takes a left turn. He doesn't go through Solomon. He goes through Nathan, another son of David. doesn't go through the royal line. He ends up through Mary. And to understand why Mary's claim is to the throne, you have to understand the daughters of Zelophehad in the Torah, where Moses was told by the five daughters that if they marry within the tribe, they could inherit. Special rule. And it was Schofield, of all people, who pointed out, I think was the first recorded to recognize that the claims of Christ hang on that peculiar element in the, in the Torah, both in Moses when, when uh, they propose it and Joshua when he fulfills it. You can study that on your own. It's interesting that Jesus presents himself as the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, on the very day that Daniel predicted. We reviewed that last time we were together. But it's interesting, did Jesus ever sit on David's throne? No. Hasn't yet. Now that leads to a gigantic theological controversy. There are many people today that argue all kinds of strange things other than the obvious that Jesus has yet to sit on David's throne. That's a political throne. It's on the earth. 
Is he on a throne today? Yes, but not as Father David's. Not, that's not David's throne. It's his father's throne. That is God the Father. And he has yet to take David's throne. Now the question is, will he ever do that? I mean, do you really believe that? Because if, if you do, that puts you in a bizarre position. See, that really underlines what Jesus' return to the earth is all about. It's setting up a kingdom. Now, it's in this vein, though, that they show you that there was a time, there was a time, that the Jewish people took this very, very seriously. Uh, to, to get into this, you need to, one other prophecy, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to the end of this pretty soon. Genesis 49. Gen we covered this in our December newsletter, but um, just by way of review then. Genesis chapter 49, Jacob, near the end of his days, is prophesying, blessing his 12 sons. And in Genesis 49, we have 12 very cryptic riddles, sort of, that Jacob pronounces on the 12 tribes. And it's a fascinating study to go through each one, but we'll just focus on the most well-known one, the most important one in many respects, and that's Genesis 49, verse 10. From 8 on, for quite a few verses, he speaks about Judah, the tribe of Judah. But in verse 10, there's a classic promise that gave the, the uh, rabbis, the Pharisees, a real heartburn. Verse 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from beneath his, between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the peoples be. Now you and I would read that and not really understand a lot about it. The first question is, what is a scepter? And it's clear, if you go through the rabbinical literature, that the scepter refers to their tribal identity and the right to apply and enforce the Mosaic laws and adjudicate capital offenses called Jus Gladii. Now, the other term that may sound strange to your ears is the term Shiloh. It was understood by the early rabbis uh, uh, and the Talmudic authorities as referring, it's a phrase that refers to the Messiah. You can find that in the Talmud. You can find that in uh, the Targum Ankylos, Targum Suda Jonathan, and a bunch of other references. Now, it's interesting that even in the Babylonian captivity, the 70 years that the nation was in slavery, they did retain in that captivity their tribal identities. They returned, retained their own logistics, their own internal judges, and so forth. And that's all documented. Now, why am I getting into all this? That's uh, ancient stuff. Because something very interesting happens in 6 to 7 A.D., King Herod's son and successor, Herod Archelaus, was dethroned and banished to Vienna, a city in Gaul. Archelaus was the second son of Herod the Great. The older son, Herod Antipater, was murdered by Herod the Great along with his other family members. If you, understand, if you study the Herod dynasty, it's pretty, pretty rough going. It was quipped at the time it was safer to be a dog in his household than to be a member of the family because they all got bumped off sooner or later. And I won't go through more of that other than the fact that this guy, he was replaced by a Roman pr procurator named Caponius. The legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and adjudication of capital cases was lost. This was normal Roman policy. Now this transfer of power from, from, from the Herodian line to the Roman administrators is mentioned in the Talmud, and it's also mentioned in Josephus. And let me just quote, the Josephus quote is really off the wall. Quote, After the death of Procurator Festus, when uh, Albinus was about to succeed him, the high priest Ananias considered a favorable opportunity to assemble the Sanhedrin. He therefore caused James, the brother of Jesus who is called the Christ, interesting reference in Josephus, by the way, to James the brother, the guy that wrote the book of James, and Jesus himself and several others, to appear before his hastily assembled council and pronounced upon them the sentence of death by stoning. All the wise men and strict observers of the law who were at Jerusalem expressed their disappropriation of this act. Some even went to Albinus himself, who had departed Alexandria, to bring this breach of the law under his observation and to inform him that Arrhenius uh, had acted illegally in assembling the Sanhedrin without Roman authority. The point being, it's an acknowledgment, just an underlying the fact that they did not have the authority to administer capital punishment. That's why... In the, in the trial of Christ, of course, they have to go to Pilate because they didn't have the authority. 
Now, the reaction to this transfer of power to Caponius is fascinating. The members of the Sanhedrin found themselves deprived of their right over life and death and covered their heads with ashes and their bodies with sackcloth and bemoaned, quote, Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. They actually, the priests went through the city wearing sackcloth and ashes, convinced that the word of God had been broken because the scepter had departed from Judah and they could, where was the Messiah? He had not come. They actually thought the Torah had failed. They should have known better because at that very moment, about 30 miles to the north, northwest, in a town called Nazareth, there was a young boy in a carpenter shop. And he would present himself as the Mashiach Nagid on the very day that Gabriel predicted in Daniel chapter 9, the very day. Every detail of this young boy's life was laid out in advance. Every detail was described with incredible accuracy. And it's interesting, we're shortly in the next few weeks going to go into the next year and all of us are going to write checks and we're all going to forget and put 1993 on the check, right? How many will do that, do you think? Okay. How many of you will never miss and always get it 94? Anyone? Every time you write a date in your checkbook, you're acknowledging the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, some errors because of calendars and stuff, but the point is it's interesting how the whole... Every time you do that, you can remind the thing of the Lord. Now, one thing, I, I, it's, it's, it's no fun to give you just nice stuff. I have to throw something else at you. I've got some bad news for you tonight. Uh, we all celebrate Christmas on December 25th, and I can't, uh, I can't uh, leave you with that misconception. My conscience would just bother me if I left you with that idea. Um, we know that Jesus could not have been born in winter. When Jesus gives his private briefing to his disciples about his second coming, he says, pray that your flight be not in winter. Why? Because Judea typically is impassable. Secondly, no Roman administrator in his right mind would have the entire province return to their home, the house, uh, their, their, you know, the house of the family during the winter. That makes sense. We also know the shepherds were, the flocks were in open field. They don't do that after October. So you know he wasn't in winter. In fact, it was probably before October. So then why do we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? The first recorded mention of December 25th is in the calendar of Philokalus, which is about 354 A.D., in other words, the 4th century, which assumed Jesus' birth to be on Friday, December 25, 1 A.D. And it was officially proclaimed by the Church Fathers in 440 A.D. as a vestige of the Roman holiday of Saturnalia. And I won't give you all of that to really put you on a guilt trip for the holidays, but mistletoe, the wassail bowl, the, all this, of, and the trimmed Christmas tree is all traditions that come from Babylon. The, uh, the worship, the, where tonight we are speaking at the winter solstice. There's one day in which the days are the shortest, the night is the longest, that's tonight, astronomically. And uh, the, uh, the Babylonian priesthood used to uh, tie that to the concept of, of Tammuz, the son of Semiramis and Nimrod, as having died and then resurrected the next morning miraculously. And they used to celebrate that by burning a log in the fireplace, which was called a Yule log. The word Yule in Chaldean means infant. And then the next morning they replaced the log with a trim tree, celebrating the resurrection of Tammuz. It's the Tammuz cult. And that, that gets transferred, of course, when Persian Empire takes over, goes to Pergamus. Then from Pergamus, when the Romans take over, it goes to Rome and becomes the f foundation stone of pagan Rome, if you will, the Saturnalia and all that. When the Roman Empire, with used to all these traditions, gets, con you know, gets uh, when they make the Christianity the state religion under, under Constantine, they start adapting all these things, putting, putting Christian paraphernalia around them. And it's understandable. It was actually encouraged by the church because it was a way of getting these people into what's going on. You know? But um, it means we've got some bizarre traditions that we all of us celebrate. I think we, we do. We still have a Christmas tree because we sort of see it as an exercise of nostalgia with the family. I'm not trying to put anyone on a guilt trip. If you want to put somebody on a guilt trip, you've got to read Jeremiah chapter 10. If you're trying to save money on not getting a Christmas tree, read Jeremiah 10, 
where he makes fun of people who take a tree and bring it to their house and trim it with gold and worship it and all that. He's, he's actually talking about idol worship, but if you read the first ten verses of that to a good Bible-believing Christian friend, you can keep him awake nights for a long time. That's right. <laughs> when was Jesus born then? That's a good question. The year of Jesus' birth is broadly accepted about 4 B.C., primarily from erroneous conclusions derived from Josephus' recording of an eclipse, assumed to be the one on March 13th of 4 B.C., shortly before Herod died, quote, unquote. There are a number of problems with this. In addition to the fact that there's more likely the eclipse on December 29th, 1 A.D., that's a whole other... They, they misunderstand even the record. But the point is, there's a considerable time between Jesus' birth and Herod's death because they, went to, they escaped to Egypt and all that business. And Herod died on January 14th, 1 B.C., so we've got a problem there. Tertullian, born about 160 A.D., uh, uh, stated that Augustus began to rule 41 years before the birth of Jesus, died 15 years after that event. Augustus died on August 19th of 14 A.D., placing Jesus' birth in 2 B.C. Tertullian also notes that Jesus was born 28 years after the death of Cleopatra in 30 B.C., which is also consistent with the 2 B.C. date. Arrhenius, born about a century after Jesus, also notes that the Lord was born in the 41st year of the reign of Augustus. And Augustus began his reign in the autumn of 43 B.C. This also seems to substantiate a 2 B.C. birth. Eusebius, who was about uh, 264 to 340 A.D., is the father of church history in the minds of many, uh, ascribes to the 42nd year of reign of Augustus and the 28th from the subjection of Egypt on the death of Anthony and Cleopatra. The 42nd year of Augustus ran from the autumn of 2 B.C. to the autumn of 1 B.C. The subjugation of Egypt and the Roman Empire occurred in the autumn of 30 B.C., the 28th year extended to the autumn of 3 B.C. to the autumn of 2 B.C. The only date that intersects then again is a 2 B.C. date. But if you really want to get complicated, you look at John the... See, we don't know a lot about Jesus' birth, but we, do, we know a lot about John the Baptist's birth. See, because uh, uh, his... Elizabeth, John's mother, was a cousin of Mary, right? And the wife of a priest named Zacharias who was of the course of Abijah. Now, the, 20, the priests were organized in 24 courses. Each course served from Shabbat to Shabbat, one week. And um, now the temple was destroyed by Titus on August 5th of 70 A.D. The first course of priests had just taken office, so we got a reference point. So working that by weeks, you can crank that back, and you'll discover since Abijah was of the eighth course, you can track backwards and determine Zechariah ended his duties on July 13th of 3 B.C. If the birth of John took place 280 days later, it would have been on April 19th to 20th, 2 B.C., precisely on Passover of that year, which is kind of interesting when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. His birthday was on Passover. Kind of interesting. Now, John began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. The minimum age for a ministry was 30. Augustus died August 19th, 14 A.D. That was his accession year for Tiberius. If John was born on April 19th to 20th, you always write that down. You want to celebrate, you want to throw a party, birthday party for John the Baptist, due at April 19th to 20th. Just I'll throw that out for you. Um, his 30th birthday would have been April 19th, uh, 29 A.D. or the 15th year of Tiberius. It seems to confirm the 2 B.C. date. Since John was five months older, this also confirms an autumn birth date for Jesus. Okay. John's repeated introduction of Jesus as the Lamb of God. I mentioned that. Elizabeth hid herself for five months when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary both Elizabeth's condition and Mary also would bear a son who would be called Jesus. Mary went in haste to Elizabeth, who was then in the first week of her sixth month or the fourth week of December 3 B.C. If Jesus was born 280 days later, it would place the date of his birth on September 29th, 2 B.C., which incidentally, that year was the Feast of Trumpets. Now, uh, first of Tishri, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, are these correct? Probably not. And if you do a lot of study in this area, you'll discover, like in anything, where you have two Jews, you've got three opinions. And there are many, many um, uh, Messianic scholars that have different views. This is the one that find, I find the most intriguing because it's got the most crisscrossing, cross-referencing. But that doesn't mean it's free of controversy. You'll find dates all the way from 4 B.C. to several A.D., and they all have problems with them. This one is not free of problems. It has the least. So I'm not, I'm not trying to sell this idea. Just It's conversation when you're having Christmas. You can disturb your friends by saying, it really wasn't December. It was December 29th. And we already celebrated a few months ago. So uh, There is a book just out, by the way, that some of this has been taken from, called The Search for Messiah. And... Uh, uh, I didn't write it. I did the forward to it, but uh, it's uh, uh, and we're not. Uh, uh, you can get them in any any Christian bookstore. Should be carrying it. But the point is, it's what makes it interesting. Is it demonstrates from the Talmud and from rabbinical sources, new discoveries from the Dead Sea Scrolls elsewhere, of what the Jews really believed in the first and second century A.D. 
because what they're taught today that they believe turns out to be not true by their own records. And what, this, what makes it so interesting is all footnoted and referenced from the Talmud and from the various Jewish authorities and also some recent discoveries from the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's amazing is that the rabbinical writings expected a Messiah that would come, that would die for his people and would come again. And you go through all the, de- all the details of the messianic expectation in the first century as from their own writings, from the rabbinical writings. Uh, it's amazing. It's a very, very exciting book. I encourage you to explore it. Um, it's uh, uh, just out and, um, and very, very readable. And uh, it will be, it's a treasure to anyone that takes the Bible seriously. Okay, so that's just some thoughts about Christmas, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, I can remember as a teenager first discovering, this, first encountering this idea that God became man and dwelt among us. That is a staggering mystery. I love the poem they talk about. With the, he was crucified on a cross of wood, and yet he made the hill on which it stood. But as you get into the Scripture... As you begin to understand God and understand man and understand the gulf between puny man and a holy God, that gap, that gulf, how, how great that gulf is. The amazing thing, the really big discovery, isn't that God became man and dwelt among us, that we celebrate Christmas. The amazing thing is that as we speak here tonight, there is a man on the throne of God. Staggering idea. Staggering idea. Now, as we study uh, Micah 5.2 and Isaiah 9.6 and uh, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Genesis 49.10 and some of these other passages we looked at, it's interesting how precise they are. He wasn't born near Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. He, he uh, presented himself as the Mashiach Nagid, not about a certain date, on the exact day that Gabriel predicted. What's fascinating is there are a lot of precise predictions about his second coming. We don't know. Relax. I'm not going to say any dates. <laughs> we don't know the date that it come, but we do know events that come after he gathers his church. The seventy-week prophecy of Daniel is Jewish. There are events that precede that. The events that follow are on the horizon. The Bible says that Babylon will re- be reestablished in the banks of Euphrates. Saddam Hussein has been working very hard to get that started. The Bible says Israel will be back in the land. Old news. Will it be removed from the land again and then have it repeat? No. Isaiah, 19, Isaiah 11 says that when I gather them the second time, they'll not be up, uprooted. And the second gathering has been going on for some years now. The Bible says that Jerusalem, the old city, the biblical Jerusalem, will be in the hands of Israel. It is. The Bible says they're going to rebuild their temple, and they're getting ready to do that. They're preparing for it vigorously. The Bible says while all that's going on, there's going to be the, the Magog is going to invade with a group of allies. They're all in place with the weapons in place. And they're practicing. All the details of Ezekiel 38 are, are visible on reconnaissance satellite. While all that's going on, the Bible says there's going to be a global super state emerge in Europe. That's happening as we speak. It's not one little check verse. It's every major theme of Bible prophecy is being moved into place for the, the big act, the final scene. Does that mean that Armageddon is at hand? Heavens, no. There's at least seven. In fact, probably substantially more than that years away. They don't get nervous about that. That doesn't mean there won't be a lot of problems, a lot of troubles, a lot of conflict. But the, the big one ain't. It's, it's off a bit. And yet, there are some circumstances that precede that that are very detailed in the Scripture, and they're all about to take place. So this Christmas, as we indulge our traditions as we as we gather to con- consider the real meaning of the season 
let's not just focus on the fact that he became a man to fulfill a destiny. Let's focus on the fact that that destiny is still incomplete. The kinsman redeemer in Book of Ruth, the Goel, had two jobs. His first job was to redeem. And if he chose to redeem, it meant he assumed all the obligation of the person he's redeeming. That was one of the part of the law, and he did. But the kinsman redeemer we speak so glibly of is also the avenger of blood. And Revelation 6 through 19 details how he's going to fulfill that. It's going to get exciting. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you. <laughs> As once again this year we focus our thoughts on the birth of our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for this season as we focus our attention on these issues. We thank you, Father, for this season in which we have a natural opportunity to explore, discuss, and manifest the incredible gift that you've given us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we would ask that you, through your Holy Spirit, would draw each of us more deeply into your Word. We would pray, Father, in this season and the coming year, that you would increase in each of us an appetite, a hunger, a passion for your Holy Word, that we might more fully comprehend the incredible gift that you've given us, the amazing redemption that's available to us for the asking, that we might just grow in grace the knowledge of Him, that we might discover, Father, what You would have of us in return, in response, especially in these days. For we commit ourselves once again into Your hands, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, in whose name we commit all these things. Amen.